Everybody, welcome. Uh, my name is Kristen Anton. I'm the Community Knowledge Manager for Heredox, and we are hosting a conference call related to documenting enforced disappearances. And this is part of a series of conference calls that we're hosting on this topic. And they are over the next two weeks here. Um, I will share with you the schedule of those, the rest of the calls um, later on in this presentation. But today we have Justine and Oslam who will be presenting on goals for documenting disappearances and also some general information about documentation and methodologies for documenting this kind of information. So I first want to give you a brief introduction to Heredox. We at Heredox support organizations and individuals to gather, analyze, and harness information to promote and protect human rights. And we believe that when human rights defenders have reliably documented, structured, searchable, and shareable information, they're then empowered to promote the truth about violations, seek redress for victims, and oppose cultures of, of impunity. We've been doing this work for 35 years, and we provide direct support to organizations, and we also build open source tools to address the gaps in documenting human rights violations, and we facilitate community discussions such as these. Uh, here on the screen, you can see the three tools that we've built. Uh, OpenFSIS is used for documenting human rights violations. Our newest tool is called OASI, and that's used for organizing, analyzing, and publishing human rights document collections. And then we have Casebox, which is a tool to manage human rights litigation documents. So why are we hosting this peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange? Every day, human rights defenders are learning how to tackle their own information management and human rights documentation problems, and they're finding really creative, innovative ways to publish their documents, categorize evidence files, visualize data, and so much more. And there's so much valuable knowledge and experience already within this community. We believe that the key is to collect, document, and organize this knowledge so that it's accessible to anybody in the community who might need it. So the Heredox Collaboratory is our attempt to facilitate and capture existing knowledge around information management and human rights documentation. We are hosting this two-week discussion on the Collaboratory, which is an online discussion forum. And anybody is welcome to join that discussion, as well as these conference calls. Everything is public. And um, we want to make sure everybody understands that so that you don't share any sensitive information. And to participate, we just really want you to ask questions, share your challenges, give advice to others, share resources that you know of that have, has been helpful. Um, we really hope that everybody feels like they can engage and participate in these kinds of discussions. You don't have to be an expert on the topic. Oops. Okay. So today uh, we have Justine DeMeo, who is the co-founder and director of Act for the Disappeared, based in Lebanon. And we have Aslam Kaya of Hafiza Marchese, which is based in Turkey. Um, I'm going to just ask you guys to introduce yep. yourselves. Um, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Aslam, do you want to just briefly introduce yourself and then we'll move to Justine? Ah, okay. Uh, <laughs> I thought we will introduce ourselves just before the presentation. Oh, okay. I'm Az okay. Actually, yeah, Aslam, we could just do that. Let's, let's yeah. move to Justine and her presentation and um, we'll come back to Aslam after the presentation. So Justine, go ahead. Yeah. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Justine. Um, I'm working on uh, the issue of the disappeared people in Lebanon. Um, so we are the, um, I'm the organization I'm working with is documenting 
cases of people who went missing in Lebanon uh, from 1975 till 2005 uh, in the context of a, of a civil war and uh, uh, Syrian and Israeli occupation. Um, so we, I mean, in the in face of a state uh, unwillingness to address the issue of the missing, we started a few years ago uh, documenting um, cases of disappearance and uh, and locating uh, sites of graves in Lebanon in order to protect them. Uh, for now, in Lebanon, there is no political will to address this issue, so we are trying to gain time and to uh, collect and preserve the data uh, for future use. Um, we also accompany the families of the missing, um, and we uh, document as well uh, the civil war um, to raise awareness among the new generation. Um, so, uh, Christine, should I start the, the presentation? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so my presentation is about the goals of documenting the disappeared. Um, so, it's important, I mean, we consider that it's important to consider the various goal uh, because, of course, it impacts the data collection method and the data management strategy. Um, so, uh, I try to identify these different goals, knowing that, of course, I mean, uh, in the Lebanese context, we are not uh, documenting for all these uh, purposes. Um, um, but, of course, I mean, the first reason why we document is to stop this, I mean, in general, is to stop disappearance, uh, and in the case in conflict uh, settings. Um, it's a case of, uh, of Syria, for example, uh, today. Uh, the second uh, goal is to reveal the fate and whereabouts of the disappeared and retrieve their remains to their families, if possible. Um, it's also for truth-telling and accountability. Uh, and lastly, uh, for reparation and memorialization. So, of course, as I said, I mean, the pursuit and achievement of these goals depend on may, many variables. Uh, first of all, if, it's, uh, if the disappearance are ongoing or if they stopped, um, say, in, in case of conflict or post-conflict settings. It also depends on the security context and if information are available, are accessible, uh, um, the relative of the missing more specifically. Um, it also depends on the political context, if there is a political transition uh, and if there is a political will to address the issue. Um, in Lebanon, for example, we don't have a political transition, um, so it impacts a lot, of course, the way we document. Um, it depends also if there is national judicial uh, system functional or if it is dysfunctional. Um, if we can count on a uh, national court to, uh, to prosecute, for example, uh, the perpetrators. Um, it depends, of course, on the needs of the victims, but because their need can change over time. And finally, it depends on the capacity of civil society organizations to undertake uh, documentation work and to develop a data management strategy. Um, so, as I said, it's important to understand these different goals because it impacts the way we document. Uh, and it's also important uh, to understand these goals and variables because uh, uh, we all know that when we document uh, uh, cases of disappearance and we interview families of missing people, uh, it's, it's very important to manage uh, their expectation and their perceptions. Uh, a lot of the of the families we interview uh, are very frustrated. Uh, I mean, in, in the case of Lebanon, for example, because um, they have been interviewed uh, many times and they didn't see any concrete results. Uh, so we need to manage their expectation and their perception. Uh, so it's, it's important to understand uh, the goals, the, the variables, and, and to be very clear on what can be achievable, uh, achieved in a, in a period of time. Um, it's, of course, it's a way to, um, to ensure uh, an effective application of the do not arm principle. 
And so the first uh, goal that uh, I identified is uh, uh, document, documentation to advocate and lobby the state to stop these appearances. Um, so we uh, use the, the information collected to denounce and advocate at the national and or international levels to put pressure uh, on the government to stop the violations. Um, usually, we, uh, it's important to show the extent of the violations of the disappearances uh, by uh, collecting list of victims, uh, by providing figures and by compiling evidence. Um, but it's also important to uh, collect uh, the stories of the disappeared person uh, and to share these stories in order to create societal support. Um, these data, this information collected, uh, usually are being used uh, for uh, to publish reports, press release, and to launch media campaign. Uh, I mean, we can take the example of Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International and their naming and shaming advocacy strategy uh, to press for uh, change. Um, the other uh, the other reason to document in and to stop these appearances is also uh, to use uh, human rights bodies. Uh, sometimes there are national mechanism. Um, it's it's rare, but sometimes it exists. Uh, there are also regional mechanisms like the Europe, European Court of Human Rights, Inter-American Human Rights System. And of course, international mechanisms like the UN Working Group on Enforced Disappearance that request government to carry out, carry out investigations. So uh, it's important to collect information from relative of missing of disappeared people um, and uh, to fill uh, application form um, to be submitted to this uh, regional and international mechanism. For the UN Working Group, for example, this application form just include names, should include just names, date, and place of disappearance. And state or state supported forces consider responsible for the disappearance. Um, so I think it's the first goal of, of documentation. Uh, it's, of course, uh, to stop uh, the disappearances. Um, the Second goal uh, is to advocate and lobby the state to investigate fate and whereabouts of disappeared people. Uh, it's, it's the case of, of Lebanon, for example, where we are in a post-conflict setting. Um, so uh, uh, we document, uh, for in Lebanon, for example, we document the needs of the victims, uh, first of all, to reinforce the legitimacy of our requests. Um, the International Committee of the Red Cross in Lebanon, for example, uh, did a need assessment of the, of the families of the missing in 2012 uh, to, to reinforce uh, the, the advocacy to uh, create a national mechanism to investigate the fate of the missing in Lebanon. Uh, we also gather a list of disappeared persons to show the scale uh, of the disappearances. Uh, and of course, we also collect life stories uh, to engage societal support and to engage the, the, the society to uh, support the right to know of the families of the disappeared people. Um, so the platform we use, um, open source tool usually is public database, publication and uh, advocacy campaign. Um, the third goal of documentation uh, is to contribute to the clarification of the fate and whereabouts of the disappeared people. Um, it's, I mean, in, in Lebanon, for example, where there is no political will to uh, create, uh, to investigate the fate of the missing and to create a national mechanism, uh, my organization has started to uh, collect information uh, about context of disappearances, about detention center, checkpoints, events related to disappearance, to disappearances. Uh, so we interview relatives of, mis of disappeared people, witnesses, members of the army, armed groups, members of the armed groups. Uh, and of course, uh, documentation, I mean, collection of information, uh, 
uh, in open sources. We also collect photos, satellite images, footages, uh, state or armed groups archives. And we use this data, uh, data management tool, so database and mapping that we develop to archive the data and to link the different layers of information uh, in order to reconstruct the itinerary of the disappeared people. Um, so, I'm sorry. Um, so it's a um, it's a screenshot of our, of the database we developed over the last years to archive uh, the information that we collect and to uh, uh, link uh, the several layers of information. So. Uh, cases of, dis of disappearance, uh, location of detention center, location of uh, checkpoints, and location of sites of graves. Um, another uh, goal of documentation is uh, to support human identification. Uh, so it's important, uh, for example, again, in the case of Lebanon, uh, to document the location of the graves and to protect them uh, from destruction. Um, in uh, Lebanon, uh, for now, we don't have the capacity to proceed with the exhumation, but uh, because a lot of, there is a lot of construction uh, happening over the last decade in the country, uh, we know that already, uh, we know that graves have been destroyed uh, because of construction. So for us, it's a priority to document the location of these graves and protect them. Um, it's also uh, important to document and develop hypotheses on the identity of the meeting of the mis of the disappeared person that are buried in the graves to facilitate the identification process once the exhumation will happen. Um, documentation to support human rights. Uh, human identification consists also of collecting uh, ante mortem data or um, what we call ante disappearance data. Uh, this includes all information on missing persons, such as personal, physical, medical, and dental information, as well as information on the circumstances of the disappearance of the person. And it also includes DNA profile data for family members. Um, this is, I mean, this documentation work is more technical. Uh, in Lebanon, for example, it is being done by the International Committee of the Red Cross that started this documentation work since 2012. Um, the, the other, um, the other uh, documentation work consists also of collecting post-mortem data once the graves are exhumed. Um, and um, this information, uh, this information, ante-mortem data and post-mortem data um, have to be uh, secured and organized and processed in a database uh, that is, that is, I mean, much more sophisticated than uh, the database we are, for example, using in Lebanon um, today. Uh, we know that uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross developed over the last years a database uh, to manage uh, ante mortem and post mortem data. Uh, ICMP as well as a database. Uh, I know that RCRC is providing this database to any organization interested in, um, in collecting uh, ante mortem data and post-mortem data, um, it's a very uh, important tool for this documentation work. Um, another goal for uh, documentation is accountability. Um, so to establish individual and state responsibility, so uh, it's the documentation work for criminal prosecutions, uh, to provide both accountability for the perpetrators uh, and uh, official accounting of the violations. Uh, so the documentation will consist of gathering evidence on the responsibility of individuals, armed groups, uh, state institutions. Um, this documentation can be used uh, in national court, uh, but if, of course, the national judicial system is dysfunctional, 
uh, it could be used in domestic trial, like in Germany, uh, for in, in, in the case of Germany that just uh, began its first prosecution for war, war crimes in Syria, or uh, at the international level, uh, like uh, ICC. Um, documentation uh, can also be, uh, sorry. I'm sorry. So documentation uh, is also important for truth telling and establish a comprehensive truth about what happened. Uh, it addresses the large societal impacts of the violation and it contributes to institute procedures to ensure that these appearances uh, do not reoccur. And the last goal of um, of documentation is of course reparation and memorialization. Uh, it's important to uh, document uh, the the lives or the lives of the uh, disappeared person, uh, to recognize them and to restore uh, their dignity. Um, so, uh, in in I mean, for this purpose, we collect life uh, histories. Um, it's also important to collect the experiences of uh, relatives of, me, of disappeared people uh, and, to, uh, and to give them uh, the opportunity to express. It's part of the, of the healing process uh, because it acknowledges their suffering. Uh, and, um, and so that's why it's important as well to collect the narratives of loss. Um, and the last, uh, the last point is also to, to document and provide this information uh, and um, uh, to remember uh, as part of uh, guarantees of non-recurrence uh, and to use the information uh, we collect to develop awareness tools and to be used as well in history curriculum uh, and also for commemoration. I will just give you an example of of what we did in lebanon a um, few years ago we created a digital memorial for uh, disappeared people um, and so we are collecting uh, the stories of the missing um, that we uh, put uh, on this uh, digital memorial um, that can be accessible uh, to um, uh, to anyone uh, interested in, in, in the issue. Uh, so these are the, are the different goals that, uh, of documenting the disappear that I found uh, to be important to mention in this presentation. Um, I mean, it's not, of course, it's not exhaustive. I think it's just the, the main categories, uh, I, would, uh, I would say. Thank you for, for your time. Thank you, Justine. This is super helpful. Uh, thank you, Justine. Um, I also would like to first briefly introduce myself then. I'm working at Hafsa Magazine, Truth Justice Memory Center in English, <laughs> Memory Studies Program. Uh, Hafsa Magazine implements a range of activities, actually, including the documentation of human rights violations, uh, and monitoring the precedent cases, legal cases, and as well as uh, dissemination of marginalized narratives on these violations to a large section of the society. I'm mainly responsible for the documentation work of the center. And since its establishment, actually like, I think now six years ago, kind of, one of the main activities of Hafza Marcus is documenting disappearances. Today, uh, I will try to focus on the process of collecting and producing documentation on disappearances, but I will say a few words on the goals of documenting as well, uh, as this will kind of lay the ground for talking about the methodologies. But I will not, you know, I will try to keep it short because Justine's presentation was so very well detailed about it. So this goes of the documenting disappeared that I kind of, uh, thing as important is this first one is uh, reaching a concrete list of the disappeared. Uh, your main aim can be to find out who was disappeared mainly. Uh, this aim might be reaching a list of concrete information about certain factors like the name of the disappeared, age, sex, and the place of and the date of the disappearance, etc. 
or you might be aiming to reach an estimated number of the disappeared in your own context. Uh, if you aim the latter, it's possible to use also some statistical techniques to reach an estimate number from a smaller data set. If you aim to reach a list with concrete information about every single disappeared person, then there are different methodologies of getting information that I will try to mention briefly later. Uh, the second goal can be called as the, this memorization uh, and restoring the stories of the disappeared. You might want to restore this, the stories and to tell the detailed stories of all single disappeared person and the dis experiences of the left behind. And you might aim to disseminate it through as many means as possible. Uh, the third one is criminal prosecutions. Uh, you might aim to define the perpetrators and gather evidences required for, to start criminal prosecutions. Uh, find, finding the whereabouts of the disappeared might also be your goal for documenting it. Uh, actually, enforced disappearance creates this emotions, all this between hope and despair, wandering and waiting, sometimes for years for the left behinds. Uh, and it creates this continuous uncertainty about the whereabouts of the disappeared. Uh, actually, this is the distinctive characteristic of the disappearance. So finding the whereabouts of the disappeared, finding the remains if they were killed, which is unfortunately mostly the case, can be the main goal of documenting the disappeared. Advocacy and lobbying efforts that I called is like you might aim to force international bodies to take proactive role as the force over the governments, which are the responsible ones from disappearances. And as the last one, reporting on various aspects of disappearance like this, then you might may want to aim to make a detailed analysis, for instance, on the state policies accompanying this period when disappearances happened, or you might aim to attract attention on the gendered impact of the disappearances, then, then your methodology is um, defined through this a specific goal of yours. So it's very important, as I said, to, for an institution de to define their goal before starting to work. Uh, because they require all different methodologies. Uh, the goal is also, as Justine also said, is very much related with the local context, of course, that disappearances occurred, and the limits of that local context and your capacities as the institution. It goes, of course, by the way, beyond my capacity to talk about different methodologies of collecting and organizing data that can be used for each respective goal. So I will limit myself to the experience of Hafza Merkezi and the context we are working in. So enforced disappearance in the context of Turkey were mainly experienced in 1990s and predominantly targeting the Kurdish population. So, in short, we are mainly working on documenting a past crime. Um, it's important to start with the definition of the crime that you're working. And enforced disappearance is recognized as a crime by many international legal and administrative bodies. The international community has taken since long steps to combat enforced disappearance, both at the regional and international level. Uh, with, for instance, this Declaration on the Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearance, the Inter-American Convention on Forced Disappearance of Persons, and Rome Statute of International Criminal Court, and as a last document is this International Convention for the Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearances, which was this, co the, this convention was opened for signature in 2007 and entered into force in 2010. Uh, this, I put here these definitions of two bodies, this um, Rome Institute and this, uh, the Convention. Uh, the definition of Rome Institute uh, actually contributed some aspects to the crime. Uh, in this statute, uh, the definition provides that a person who is committing an act of enforced disappearance has to do it with the authorization, support, or acquiescence of a state or a political institution, organization. Uh, so it means that actually the policy of enforced disappearance has to originate not from personal intentions, but from policy of a state or from the activity of a political organization. 
But actually, neither the Declaration nor the Inter-American Convention mentions political organizations as entities that authorize or support such an act. Uh, so, so this draft, uh, this convention uh, refers only to the state's a direct or indirect participation through it provides for the state's state parties responsibility to investigate the cases of disappearances committed without the state's intervention. Besides, uh, I want to uh, pay you know attract attention to one other issue, like this convention, uh, contrary to the declaration uh, on the protection of all persons from enforced disappearances. Uh, goes further when defining the concept of victim. According to the convention, victim means the abducted person and any individual who has suffered harm as the direct result of enforced disappearance. So this definition covers both direct and indirect victims in a way. Here, uh, it makes you can see that it makes a difference how you define the enforced disappearance. So we in Hafza Merkezi follow the definition of International Convention for the Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearance of the UN. Uh, so because this matches well with our aim of documenting state crimes first, to document the experiences of the left behinds who are also directly affected from the crime of enforced disappearances. Uh, I would like to mention one other aspect here that you should take into consideration for defining the crime uh, is actually it is the it is the information regarding the whereabouts of the disappeared. So this uh, you know as a, as this international body, the working group is quite an important one. Uh, this working group on enforced and or involuntary disappearances. They define, for instance, their role as ending when the fate or whereabouts of the disappeared person have been clearly established. Uh, we, for example, for instance, in Hafza Marcus, believe that the status of disappeared should not be removed when the body is found because the crimes connected are still, the, are still there and because these people were placed outside the protection of law even in case of short period of time, like some days until their bodies were found. So in short, it's important for an institution to define accordingly and, and be transparent and coherent about this definition. Uh, what are the sources that you can use to document the disappearances? Uh, the first one is this previous works on enforced disappearances of both national and international bodies. It is uh, so probable that there are some other human rights institutions that have been working on different di di disappearances before. Um, if you necessitate to do further investigation on the topic, it might be either because it's not possible to reach these documents of the other institutions or they're outdated or not systematic enough or collected for a different aim than yours. But in any case, collecting all the previous resources on the topic should be a starting point for documentation work on any kind of human rights abuses. Uh, these resources can be the works of other institutions, and sometimes work of state bodies, like parliamentary investigation committees, for instance, or works of in individual researchers or journalists, you know, can be also your sources. Uh, this is, of course, yeah, this is, I'm mainly talking about, of course, this, uh, if you're working about a past crime. Uh, the challenge here is all, that this all incompatibilities of the previous works with your current goal of documentation. Uh, and this media, um, this legal documents, uh, this investigation files, verdicts of national and international bodies can be your sources. Because many, actually many left behind, many family members of the disappeared, uh, try to force criminal justice for accountability. So it's so likely to reach information about disappearances from past investigation files and or verdicts. Uh, I'm talking about, of course, again, documenting um, past crimes. 
Uh, legal documents can likewise be among your primary sources if you're documenting also, of course, a recent crime. Families of the disappeared might go to prosecution offices to file complaints before any kind of NGO or political organization. This is quite likely. So, but but uh, what's also likely is this challenge that I would like to mention here, that the information that the relatives might give testimonies to the legal bodies uh, might be different than they would give testimony to you. You know, this might happen partly because they are afraid of further punishments of state powers or feel more comfortable sharing their real experiences of actual events with a non-state actor. So this is quite a challenge there. And media monitoring or scanning that I, we might say, this both published and digital media scanning, especially the latter in today's world, creates an extensive so resource for any kind of research today. Uh, although we do believe that internet is such an extensive source of data and it saves everything, it is also very likely to get lost in internet search and lose the information that once was there. So it becomes important also how you save, collect and organize the data that you're gathering from internet sources. Uh, besides, again, if you're working mainly on a past crime, all the printed media sources are very likely not to be digitalized. So this would require longer period of time to be spent in libraries to search all printed copies of certain newspapers, magazines, and or reports. And the digitization of those printed media, of course, also becomes an issue. And last one is the survivor's testimonies. Survivors, mainly, I mean the families of the disappeared and the uh, left behinds. Uh, these are, of course, the first and information about disappearances and also the most valuable ones for any kind of goal that you have defined beforehand. I would like to go into deeper uh, into the principles of collecting testimonies. Uh, you first have to define your interview methodology based on the goal of your documentation. Uh, the survivor's testimonies give the first hand information, which can provide you the source of any kind of goal, as I just said. So if you aim to reach, a, for example, a concrete list of the disappeared, you might find it enough to go to the survivors, to the family members, with a written form to fill with some basic information. Or if you find, aim to facilitate the efforts for, for future identification of the bodies, for example, found in uh, this mass graves, and uh, you might even choose to work with forensic anthropology team to gather information for further identification. If you aim to restore the stories of the disappeared, you might choose to get as much detailed information as possible from the survivors about the disappeared in a life story format, for instance, uh, or and the details of the life of the left, left behind following the disappearance, how their lives were affected from it, from this crime. Uh, if you aim to analyze the disappearance strategy from different aspects, uh, like as I just gave an example from a gendered point of view, you should define your questionnaire accordingly. Uh, if you aim to work for accountability, you should try to get information about suspects, perpetrators, or any kind of information maybe that can be used for a criminal law case. So, but regardless of your aim, uh, a certain level of factual data, like the name, of the disappeared, age, sex of the disappeared one, and the place and date of the disappearance, and details about how the disappearance happened, who the suspects were, all this individual factual information has to be gathered. Especially if you're using a more semi-structured or and especially life story method of interview, it is so likely to be missing out the, these factual information. So it's important uh, maybe also then to go with a detailed form of the factual information that you have to get to document a disappearance case and which you might form, fill that form 
uh, after finishing your uh, interview, which was in a life story, story, which was following a life story methodology, for instance. The challenge here is, um, although the interviews are being considered as the first-hand knowledge about the fact and the disappeared person, especially in the situations of older conflict, it might be difficult for the survivors, for the uh, family members, to remember certain details or crucial information like the exact date of the disappearance. So that's why it's always important how you verify the information that you gathered from uh, different sources that I will try to discuss a little bit later. Um, inter interviewers we, uh, have to be trained, by the way, I wrote it wrong, I guess, interviewers have to be trained uh, before going to the interview with the relatives of disappeared. Uh, we should never forget that these people are actually giving such a crucial and personal information about, about their info experiences to us. So, and we are not holding a position of uh, quote unquote to, to like doing a favor to them. So, and and besides, the secondary traumatization is quite a crucial challenge. So, interviewers should be equipped with the methods to avoid this transition, if not totally, at least to a possible extent. It's mostly not possible and not preferable because of many different constraints to go to these people for a second round of in interview. So it's important to be trained to gather all the relevant information from the relatives. Uh, so interviews should have also an unbiased approach. Uh, they have to be fully trained about the context interview techniques, questions to be asked, and the method the questions should be asked. And interviews, uh, this is quite important for our context, so uh, I would like to also mention this. Interviews should be done in the language with the, which, which the interviewees express themselves most comfortably in, so which is mostly their mother tongue. So it's important to have interviewers who, who can speak a language, for our case, the majority of the interviews that we conducted were done in Kurdish by Kurdish-speaking researchers. As I had mentioned, uh, it's probable that the families concrete dates, places, and names. Interviewers also should be trained to ask questions in a way to facilitate them to remember some certain information but should also always respect certain boundaries of further asking. Uh, it is very important being, to be transparent about the content, extent, uh, and aim of the research and the institution. You have to give any kind of information about the details of the institution, your goal of documentation to the interviewees. So you should make it make clear that the institution you work for and the impact it has on actually bringing these cases to public or to court might rather be limited. So you should share it with the family so that, that, that families of the disappeared should be aware of it for you actually not to create disappointment. This consent form, uh, this, uh, this is what we use. It is like because all the information that is given to us by the family members are open to use within the limits of their consent. So, you know, you might uh, always obey to their consent. You can take their consent in the in a form in various formats. Uh, the challenge here is, of course, they might not allow you to use the information for any means, but you ha have to keep this information as confidential information. Then you know, like. This confidentiality issue, by the way, is a topic in itself, but uh, we have to remember that the consent of the relatives is the initial and most important precondition to ensure an ethically correct framework of conducting those interviews. So how can you can reach the survivors, the family members, and how they can reach you? There are many different ways here. This coordination between the institutions is quite important. 
uh, very crucial at this level uh, because it's mostly through some other grassroots that, uh, for example, for instance, in our case, we were reaching through uh, those uh, family organizations, grassroots solidarity organizations to the families or the municipalities and local bodies are of great help. Uh, snowball technique is the, the which means this uh, relatives of the disappeared themselves might be uh, the uh, might be the ones who connect you to the other relatives and you should of course also facilitate the ways for the survivors to reach you by you know through your um, disseminating the your activities in various uh, well, quite a bit wide range of activities um, this, at this very point, I would like to point out our current challenges conducting our research. Um, in the light of the recurrence of the armed conflict in the region, in uh, the Kurdish region in Turkey, it started becoming a bigger challenge for us continuing to conduct interviews with, uh, as they are being targeted once more by the military op recent military operations in the region. As a result, uh, like uh, yes, like with the, the, this run curfew started to be announced in the region, and certain areas of prior research even became unreachable for us. Uh, and uh, in the light of this past coup attempt operations and the continuous declaration of this emergency state, many local and grassroots institutions that getting our um, this uh, relatives they were they were our, our partner organizations have been accused of stay down so this is quite a challenge that today in our for our documentation and um, the data gathered within the research process consists of many various different kinds of formats um, this, if the, if, for example, we are doing this interviews, and if they, if the interview allows, we can take the video and audio record of the interviews. It's very important to have these records, also for any kind of uh, this further memorization attempts that we might uh, follow. This transcriptions of the interviews, and if necessary, translation of them, like because. Actually, in order to use the information delivered into interviews, it's always the transcriptions of the interviews that are being reviewed. So you never go back to the audio or video record of the interview. So that's why actually transcription is considerably easy, but also an important job that has to be done very carefully. Uh, transcription of an interview should be done first in the language of the interview. If needed, the transcription transcript should be also translated into another language for uh, like kind of enlarging the uh, potential readership. Uh, photography and video content, this video content apart from this interviews, I mean, like any kind of photography and video content about the disappeared and the disappearance might be also documented. All these contents should be saved in the formats that ensure highest quality while taking the least space that I will tell what we use uh, in a moment. and this hard copy and soft copy legal files like this while some legal files can be found online like the european court of human rights verdicts for instance some others have to be collected from prosecution offices like these are all this hard copy files that you might be collecting to, to document enforced appearances and this published and digital media sources are like it, okay it's it's of course like i would now recommend uh, to listen all this digitalization tools being shared in previous community discussion actually it would help us to find the best way to save published media sources also yeah for for instance we use a scanner pro app I just to mention, and yeah, needless to say that this digital media sources also should be saved not only in uh, web links but in PDF and readable formats.
Uh, as I said, different forms of data should be stored in most feasible form uh, mods, and they should be all be digitalized in machine readable formats. Uh, video and audio contents that are uh, of the interviews, for example, are usually um, using quite a large memory space. Uh, we actually use ClipRap uh, as a program, which is easy to get. It wraps the video and meta metadata and the time span loosely in a standard container that we can easily archive or share with video editors. So it makes it easier for us also to save. And they should be linked to each other. All this data that we're collecting from various sources are, should be linked to each other according to the defined categories of analysis. Like you can be uh, collecting them all in this based on the disappeared person or based on disappearance as an event. Verification um, is quite an important issue. Uh, and yeah, like an institution working on this documenting any kind of actually human rights abuses should define their verification strategy and be transparent about it. Um, we, for example, in Hafza Merkezi, try to verify a disappearance case from two independent sources. However, but we, we defined it as a strategy just at the, at the initial stage of our work. Then we experienced by time that actually there are some, some, some family members who interviewed with us for the first time. So, you know, there's, it's not possible to find any other single second uh, document about that disappearance case. So we, so we decided to accept their interviews to be used as a single source information. It's all, it's, it is, the important thing here is to be clear and transparent about your verification strategy. So, because there's no one fits all strategy here. And you should define the, your, your strategy for contradictory data. You might even choose to give primacy to certain sources for some information, for example. Uh, again, I'm, I'm <laughs> constantly saying it, but this is very important because what is important, what's crucial here is being transparent and coherent about your decision and, and application of it. For instance, uh, like in again in the in our case in our context uh, in Turkey accountability is such a huge challenge and there is a long lasting problem of impunity especially uh, for the violations perpetrated by perpetrated by state actors and statute of limitation is the biggest challenge creating this problem of impunity for the crimes committed before. So that's why we are trying to attract this attention to the problem of impunity and force legal mechanisms for accountability. Um, and for this reason, we give primacy to legal documents for the information regarding the date of the incident, because all the statute of limitations are defined through the dates being uh, dates on those log legal documents. So we give primacy to them, but we are, we are quite open about, uh, about the reason, reason behind this. Uh, of course, if you are entering any date, your data in any kind of database, you can also define categories of like not known, not confirmed kind of the, uh, categories you can define. Uh, some databases give you actually this chance uh, to enter different data in different documents and you're able to see the see this various data at the same time. In some other databases you have to still make a decision to fill the information but it's mostly manageable when you're transparent about the strategy that you're applying as I said. Um, as a last point, I would like to just say just a few words quick on the platforms and databases that you store and publish your documentation. Um, uh, information about disappearances can be stored and organized in paper documents, digital files, or in coded databases. Uh, and as you can see in the small picture, this is our hard copy archive, a small part of it. 
we have still a physical archive organizers organized on the basis of the disappeared person. So all these files are uh, the disappeared ones. Uh, there's a huge security challenge, of course, for the physical archives because there's no way to back up a physical archive. So uh, as a backup as a physical archive. So that's why we are first of all take the digital copies of every single item, of course, in our physical archive. We keep originally signed documents separate. And uh, of course, where you locate the physical ar archive is also a key issue. It can be an option not keeping in high risk environments. And uh, unfortunately, in some, depending on the context, your own office might even be a high, highly risky environment to keep your physical archive. So you should pay attention to this. Uh, our digital archive is not organized in a data point based format yet. Uh, however, in the same in the same categorical structure with the physical archive of ours, we we uh, we have a uh, digital archive, as I said, based on this disappeared ones. Uh, the security challenge is here. This, of course, this yeah, as I said, this importance of digitalization. You have to have all the documents, hard copy documents, also digitalized, and you have to have backups, of course. And this digital world and the tools being used for digitalization also develops incredibly fast. <laughs> so it's important to be up to date with the technological developments and modernize your archive accordingly. Online databases are like we can, these can be used both for organizing your data and opening up your data to a wider public on a web page. We are using uh, both this uh, OpenAMSYS and OVAZI developed by Herodox. We, we are actually using OpenAMSYS, but we currently start to use OVAZI. So we are still, uh, this is what recommended by uh, to us by the Surdox team uh, because I would because at this very moment I would like to turn back to the initial topic of ours uh, this defining the goals of documenting the disappeared because choosing database structures is also closely related with your goal for this is uh, our database uh, on the enforced disappearances like here uh, this this database gave kind of uh, uh, this of course this is the internet uh, you know web page uh, that you can see it um, this is compatible with our memorization goal uh, and because we give all this detailed information about the but about how the disappearance happened and also we have this we can share small videos from the interviews that we did, we conducted. Also, we give detailed information about, uh, because as we want to fight for accountability, we are also trying to give detailed information about the perpetrators and even the political suspects of, the, uh, of that period. Uh, I think it was quite a long presentation. Thank you for... Uh, listening to me and and I'm ready to hear your comments and answer further questions and these are our web pages and Facebook and Twitter accounts and you can reach me personally from my mail address or the the info mail address of Hafsa Marquis. Thanks. Thank you so much Aslam. That was a great overview of your work and of the many considerations that go into documenting disappearances. Um, now, uh, if you, if Justine and Aslam, if you guys feel comfortable, you can go ahead and stop sharing your screen and you yes. can turn on your video. Um, I want to ask the 8 to 11 people that are watching the presentation, if you have any questions or comments, please type those into the chat that you can find on the YouTube page where you're watching this presentation. You should see a live chat to the right of the um, ah, yes, I can also video. see it. Cool. Uh, we don't have any questions yet. Um, Friedhelm said thank you for presenting. It's, it was an interesting presentation. Um, Friedhelm of Herodox. 
But yes. I believe that Indira might have a question. Indira, do you want to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask? Yeah, I actually have two questions. Um, one is um, so one is for Oslem, and I was wondering if you have any other example on what you were calling memorialization. Any other example on how maybe you are trying to reach out more people, maybe in the um, maybe outside, like offline. And also, I wanted to ask both of you. Um, if there is any way you are bringing the information that you are collecting back to the families, do you do any sort of process or how can they also have access to that, to that information? That we are collecting. Yes. About. Uh, yeah, for the second one, for example, I can immediately say, of course, we are not, we are trying to do our best and it's not possible, it's, it's uh, limited with the political uh, context, of course, but um, in the first year of our work, we, we were publishing all these reports, uh, you know, based on this uh, field search that we were doing and we were we are, we are we always give importance to publish these reports in three languages like Turkish, uh, English, and Kurdish. And we were you know we were going back to those families to the ones at least we are able to reach and uh, give this um, reports on the published you know uh, form to them like at least to for them also to see uh, you know where or how all this information is are being made public in which forms justin do you want to yeah um so what i mean the information uh, we collect from families um we collect the stories of of the uh, of their loved one, and we uh, use information collected to create a, a profile page on the on the online memorial that I mentioned during my presentation. So the families can uh, so we inform the families once the profile page of their loved one is created on the online memorial. We inform them. Um, we also publish uh, the stories of their uh, loved one in uh, a national newspaper uh, every uh, uh, once a week. Uh, so we also inform them that the story of their loved one will be published. Um, and we uh, publish also once a year uh, the stories of the miss of the disappeared people that we uh, collected over the year. So we publish uh, them uh, on the occasion of the outbreak of the of the civil war in Lebanon, and we uh, provide uh, the families with this uh, publication. For now, uh, regarding the, the the documentation work that we do on to contribute to clarify the fate of the disappeared, uh, we did not start it yet to share this information with them because we don't want to raise expectations. Uh, so for now, this information uh, remains confidential and are not accessible to the families. I'm trying to find an example that we did. Let me show you. About how our, about our memorization attempt, mm. specifically on enforced disappearances. Yeah, we have a web page called Memorialize Turkey. By the way, it's mm. a web page, but it is not specifically on uh, on enforced disappearances. Like, I would like to give an example, but sorry, I need. Of minutes for it. 
here. Um, on this um, humorized day in 2015, it's the December the 10th, uh, we, we made a uh, campaign to actually to draw attention on this policy of enforced appearances and it was a poster campaign. So we kind of chose um, like six disappeared people who, who disappeared actually in December in different, uh, mostly, mostly actually 90s of course. And we did a poster campaign. Let me try to share with you. I'm actually sharing the link that Justine just shared. Is this the website you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, the online memorial. Yes. So you could just, um, Aslam, you could just yes, explain. Here, yeah, I can also share. Great. These are the, this, these are the photos from that campaign of ours. This is one example that I can, I thought might be relevant to show. These are quite, you know, um, crowded places in Istanbul where hmm. we shared. And that's powerful. The, the pastor of the, yeah, disappeared. Thanks for sharing that. Justine, did you have anything else that you wanted to say on memorializing? Um, yeah, I mean, we, uh, we commemorate we, every year uh, the outbreak of the, of the civil war in Lebanon. Um, through, I mean, so we organize poster campaign, uh, um, TV spot campaign. Um, yeah, and so we are trying to 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 share these uh, life stories with the public um, and raise awareness on, on the issue of the missing and engage the society to support the families' uh, mm -hmm. uh, right to know. Um, I mean, I can share uh, in the coming days uh, some of the of the poster campaign and TV campaign that we that we implemented in the past. I can share that on the in the forum. That would be great. The, yeah, yeah. And great. I would like to also say, of course, just one thing that it's not organized by us, but the relatives of the disappeared in Turkey are getting, you know, are continuing their weekly uh, demonstration every, like, since 1995 mm -hmm. in various spots in Turkey, like the most well known is the Galatasaray Square and Istiklal Street in Istanbul. So this is, of course, the most long lasting and the most powerful memorization attempt that they are themselves are continuing since years. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, thank you. We have another question from Isabella Regan. And she's asking Aslam, but I think it's really for both of you. Um, she's wondering, what do you think the biggest methodolo methodological challenges are when documenting enforced disappearances compared to other human rights violations. I'm not sure if, mm. if, if you have any thoughts on that. Um, otherwise, we can also raise this with Bert when he is participating next week because he's documented many different kinds of violations. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, compare, it's, it's of course hard to give an answer in that comparative manner of, you know, the biggest challenge compared to the others, but... I think one challenge that you both had mentioned is 
when a lot of time has passed, it's really difficult to get evidence, get information. Yeah, um, I mean, it's true. I think it's one of the main challenges, but I think it's, I mean, not necessarily uh, only when uh, time uh, passed. I think that a lot of uh, relatives of missing people, of these of disappeared people that we interview, uh, don't have any information uh, on on what happened. Uh, for example, in, in Lebanon, a lot of them uh, can just tell us that their loved one uh, left uh, in the morning. They were supposed to go to work or they were supposed to go to university and they never came back. So, um, I, yeah, it's very difficult to... to 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 get information and that's why i mean it's in i mean in such cases we try to uh to reconstruct the potential itinerary of the person uh and so we document um not direct information related to the case but for example we document uh any uh, detention centers or any checkpoint that could have been, um, yeah. I mean, where the person could have been brought uh, or kidnapped. So, yeah, I mean, access of, of, of information is, is very, very difficult, yeah. Yeah, the uncertainty about the crime itself and the perpetrators is quite the challenge, of course, here to define, because this is, this is actually the main aim of this specific crime, you know, to create mm -hmm. such an uncertainty about it. And of course, about the exhumations, we, we don't aim to continue a work on it. We actually, when we started to uh, do all this field search and interview with the relatives, we also tried to gather information about further uh, attempts for exhumations and anything. You know, we were asking, for example, what the disappeared one was wearing when she, he, he or she was abducted and the stuff. But then, uh, you know, very much depending on the political context in Turkey, this human rights defenders themselves and the lawyers, human rights lawyers, they, they themselves started and decided not to force for this exhumations because like in some, like, I don't know, t uh, seven to 10 years ago, they were forcing for it because we just, they, they started to realize that they were not, the, all these exhumations were not doing were not done according to the law, you know. So mm. it, it made it even worse and it made it even harder to reach any kind of, you know, to, to any, any kind of identification. Mm -hmm. uh, so, like, then, then human rights defenders in Turkey in general, in, you know, uh, uh, they decided not to, for, not to force for um, this they did, decided not to give primacy to exhumations, but just to de to define at least the places of the mass graves. There's also a very uh, impressive, I would say, but this is not the word I know, a map prepared by Human Rights Association in Turkey on this mass grave mm. uh, of. Uh, in in Turkey, and of course, they are not only the mass graves where uh, it's uh, thought that ex uh, disappeared ones are laying. It's, it's also the mass graves for some guerrilla forces and stuff. But it's quite an extensive map, and you know, it's like we know uh, not. Uh, specifically our institution, but a human rights movement in general is giving primacy to to define at least the locations of it for today. <laughs> Maybe for further identification attempts, which will be done hopefully in a more appropriate manner. Thank you. Um... So that's all the questions that have come in, and I think that you've given us so much to talk about on, in the discussion forum. So maybe this is a good time to wrap up this call. I just have a few other things I wanted to share with the audience. So let me share my screen again. Uh, so 
This conference call is part of our two-week online discussion on documenting the disappeared. And we would like for all of you to go on to our collaboratory.herodox.org website to continue this conversation, to ask your questions, to share your advice, share resources, um, just communicate with your peers your experiences and your knowledge. Uh, this is a screenshot, but I'm also going to show you live what this forum looks like. The documenting the disappear discussion is featured at the very top here under category. So if you click on that link, uh, there's a brief introduction to the topic, and then you can see that there are these main discussion threads. Today we were talking a lot about goals of documenting enforced disappearances, but we also touched on a lot of these other topics as well. And for our upcoming conference calls, our next one is on Friday, this Friday at 1800 UTC, uh, where Tamara will be presenting her experiences and knowledge uh, from Mexico. You can find all these links and all this information on our Herodox website, but also on the collaboratory site. And then we have two more next week. So on Monday, December 4th, uh, Selena will be speaking about a case study from Argentina. And then on Wednesday, December 6th, we have Jorge and Denise talking about uh, statistical models, methodologies, and technology platforms for documentation. OK, I think that's it. Uh, I want to thank you too so much, Justine and Aslam. Thank you for sharing all this great information. Um, this call is being recorded, and I will embed it in the Collaboratory website so everybody can access this. And we'll also be putting together a summary of everything that's discussed. So a lot of this information will be documented in that form as well. And that will be shared on the Herodox website. So again, thank you, and I look forward thank to you. continuing this conversation in the forum. Thanks, you guys.